Welcome to Lecture 7 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we'll get a quick overview of the concept of source coding, channel coding, and the fundamentals of the communications channel. So let's revisit um, what our typical digital communication system looks like from, from several lectures ago. So let's redraw our communication system, digital communication system. So we have our binary source that's fed into our source encoder, which is then fed into our channel encoder, which is then fed into our modulator. gets converted into an analog signal, goes through an RF front end, is sent over the air or is transmitted over some line, goes through something called the channel, which we'll talk about later in this lecture, and is picked up by the receiver. So this here is our transmitter. And a receiver, hopefully it's listening, picks it up, the RF front end brings it down from, let's say, the baseband to RF frequencies. So now it's picking up at RF, converts it back down to baseband, is analog to digital converted, demodulated. channel decoded, source decoded, and fed into a binary sync. Now, just let's, let's look at a few things. First of all, here's our boundary between the digital world and the analog world, all right? So uh, what will and and of course this is the receiver just to so so what we're going to look at here in, in this lecture is we're going to look at the source encoding and decoding the channel encoding and decoding and this thing called the channel okay and what we're going to look at is um, how the source encoder takes the ones and zeros that are produced by the binary source and strips out all redundant information. Then the output of the source encoder, we're gonna observe how the channel encoder adds some controlled redundancy to protect that information in case it gets corrupted by the channel. And we're gonna see the opposite operations done at the receiver. And we're gonna look a little bit of, first of all, um, the channel itself, and in particular an AWGN channel, which we'll be using extensively in this course. Okay, so now that we've seen the anatomy of a digital communication system and all the blocks that constitute it, um, let's take a step back and, and, and sort of look at why digital communications, what's so important about digital communications? Well, digital communications is essentially the process of trying to transmit a message, M of T, to some sort of intended receiver. And the goal is to, to sort of like uh, craft that message in such a way that when the receiver picks it up, it, it's able to decode it, demodulate it, uh, post-process it, and try and reconstruct the message you were trying to transmit. So if I try to transmit M of T, the receiver will, will generate a reconstructed version of that message called MT hat. Now, the problem is, um, in, in digital communications, there's usually no strings attached um, that we hope that the receiver will calculate correctly or determine uh, the message that we transmitted. Um, unfortunately, as we talked about before, there's elements of noise and other sort of randomness in the uh, transmission environment that uh, potentially uh, the, the, the receiver is performing more of a very, very, um, 
uh, informed, uh, educated guess. And so uh, we need some sort of way of analyzing how well our receiver is performing in terms of guessing or determining um, or reconstructing that message we're trying to transmit. And that metric, and we're going to hear this metric throughout the rest of this course, is called the probability of error. What, what this means is because this is a, a random phenomenon, uh, it's not very useful to know the instantaneous sort of like uh, the instantaneous sort of error rate. We want to know on average how well the system, the, both the transmitter and receiver are performing uh, given a specific scenario. And so what we do is we use the, the concept of probability. So the probability that the reconstructed message does not match the transmitted message, uh, that's our goal is to bring that probability to zero, or at the very least, keep it, keep it to as small a value as possible. So the probability of error, or PE, is the probability that reconstructed does not match what was transmitted. And we really, really want to keep that as small, or even eliminate it as much as possible. It's interesting to note that, depending on your application, um, acceptable probability of errors vary. Uh, for instance, voice, digitized voice communications, um, usually a probability of error of 10 to the minus 3. So one out of every thousand bits is an error. That's actually deemed acceptable because uh, for one reason or another, uh, the human mind is able to sort of uh, gloss over uh, those errors and, 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 and the speech or whatever sort of information that's being communicated is still intelligible. Data applications, on the other hand, usually have an acceptable probability of error range uh, between 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6. So um, uh, 1 out of 10,000 to 1 every, every 100,000 uh, bits is an error. Uh, and any more bits that are an error, uh, such as like the voice probability of error um, uh, range for a data application, is considered unacceptable. Finally, uh, fiber optics, because uh, the amount of data transmitted in unit time is so immense in a lot of applications that we have to have an extremely low probability of error of at least 10 to the minus 9. So let's, looking at that block diagram we drew several slides ago of our digital communication system. Let's, let's dig a little deeper into this concept of source coding. So the source coder uh, works as follows. Um, so we have a, a, a sequence of source symbols or bits, right? And we represent it by some sort of vector u. And what we want to do is we want to convert u into another sequence v. And v is much smaller in size to u. So um, and the way this works is the source encoder, what it does is it looks for the same pattern of bits that occur over and over and over again. So large patterns of bits and, and assign a code word, if you will, to that pattern. But, and that code word is much smaller in size than the actual uh, bit sequence that's, uh, that, that is being represented by that code word. So what happens is we want to have um, the, the, these uh, sequences of source bits um, uh, represented by these much shorter code words, which will essentially compress our transmission. So if we replace all those like large number of bits by these smaller code words, already we, we've won because we, we've, we've essentially removed a whole bunch of redundant bits that would otherwise be included in the transmission. Furthermore, what's, what's a requirement on these code words, on these Vs, these sequences of source encoded symbols? Well, what we want is we want to keep those code words as random as possible. We want as little redundant information in those code words as possible. What we're trying to do is minimize as much as possible the amount of redundancy in the transmission. And we know we've achieved um, an, an excellent uh, set of uh, sequences of source encoded symbols when those source encoded symbols, those sequences, are uh, deemed as uncorrelated or unrelated with each other. When we reach that point, we know if we have true randomness in that sequence that there is no redundancy um, and, and we've achieved the, the goal of the source encoder. Okay. So, so what happens is, is that um, just a quick note is that the, the information that is fed into the source encoder has got to be digital. It's got to be ones and zeros. 
And so, um, how how much of an impact would source encoding have on a, on 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 a digital transmission? Well, here's an example: analog TV channels uh, before they were deactivated in 2009 in the United States use six megahertz of bandwidth to represent a single channel. Nowadays, with digital TV. Uh, that, uh, because it's all digital and there's a lot of digital encoding, including like MPEG-2 and, 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 a lot, and, and, and a lot of source coding, what happens is you can get between 6 and 8 digital encoded TV channels that can fit in the same 6 megahertz bandwidth. So for the same bandwidth, for the same channel width, we now have 6 to 8 actual TV channels transmitting across it. That is the power of doing source encoding. When we remove the redundancy, uh, the digital transmission um, uh, doesn't need a lot of bandwidth in order to get that information across. So the, the other concept that, uh, that we should talk about is something called channel coding. So this almost is contradictory to source encoding, where in source encoding, what we were trying to do was remove all redundancy. Channel coding is the process of adding a little bit of redundancy. But as opposed to the redundancy that the source encoder is trying to remove, the channel coding is trying to include redundancy in a controlled manner that we can leverage later on at the receiver. The trick is we're doing channel coding because at the receiver, we have a regime, we have a scheme to use that redundant information to make sure that if any bits have been corrupted, we can recover that corruption. Well, first of all, know that there's corruption. And secondly, we can reverse that corruption to the original state. That's, that's fantastic. Okay. So, so really, channel encoding is all about uh, the controlled introduction redundancy. So what we do is now that we have these source encoded outputs of VL, what we do is we now assign, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, these unique uh, code words, if you will. And so what we want to do now is essentially take um, each one of those vectors of source encoded outputs, assign a unique code word, okay? And the code word is CL uh, for, for VL. And, and all these code words come from some sort of code book. And, and the thing is, is that these code words are actually larger in size, okay? In terms of number of bits, relative to the source encoded uh, sequence that we're taking in to be encoded, channel encoded. And so uh, what happens is uh, suppose that the size of the source encoded output is k bits long and the code word is n bits long. Uh, the amount of redundant control bits added to that, um, uh, 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 you know, to that sequence, uh, to the size of the sequence in order to protect it against possible errors that are introduced in the transmission is R, N minus K equals R. And a term that you may have, may have heard before is something called the code rate. And what the code rate is, is essentially the, equal to the ratio of the number of information bits, okay? So that's uh, K um, uh, divided by the, the uh, size of the code word, which is N. So I told now I've told you what channel coding is, how uh, what the purpose of including redundancy, how we calculate the code rate. Let's let's look at the concept called Hamming distance. So Hamming distance because because one thing I have not told you is how to make a channel coder. What 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 how do we add that? What's the best way? What's the best way of generating those redundant bits? that can help us later on. And what happens is we'll get there in a second. And there, are, there is a wide variety of types of uh, channel coding schemes. But before we get there, we need to know which channel coding schemes are actually good and which ones are not so good. And, and so we use a metric called Hamming distance. Okay? And it's represented by uh, the, the expression dh c i c j. So what does that mean? So dh, d represents some sort of distance. Okay, so this is our metric, and H, the subscript H represents Hamming. Okay, so DH and CI, CJ. So CI is one code word, CJ is another code word, and what we want to do, what Hamming distance is all about, is how different 
is one code word versus another. In terms of the, uh, you know, posi uh, from position to position, how much are they different by? So if I have a code word 111 and I have another code word 000, how much are they diff different by? What's their Hamming distance? And the answer would be three. All three positions are opposite to each other. On the other hand, if I had code word 111 and code word 101, what's its Hamming distance? And the answer would be one, because only the middle position is actually different and the other two are not. And that could potentially could be a really crummy code word or a set of code words, because the, the goal is, is to have the Hamming distance as far apart from each other. So, we, so if we ever receive um, a, 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 a transmission um, and we get um, a, a code word, uh, there is we decrease the probability of incorrectly determining that it's another code word instead of the one that we actually received. So uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize Hamming distances across all code words within a code book. And so that's represented here by equation one, uh, where the, the minimum Hamming distance, so dh min, is equal to uh, the smallest um, smallest Hamming distance between uh, two code words across all possible combination of code words in a code book, excluding code words that are identical to each other. Okay, so we can't do CI and CI because obviously they 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 should be identical. So as I as I brought up in the example before, um, we have some good code words and good Hamming distances, and we have some poor ones as we can see below. So um, we can graphically represent code words and Hamming distances and uh, finding out how well one code book works versus another using a concept called decoding spheres, otherwise known as Hamming spheres. And um, the radius is actually equal to the minimum Hamming distance. So we're going to look at that right now. So let's take a simple code book. Let's say our, we have a code book. It has two code words. 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, and, and they represent 0 and 1. So we're dealing with a repetition code here. Graphically, let's, let's draw this, okay? So we have here that this loci, locus is representing 0, 0, 0, and this one's representing 1, 1, 1. The physical separation between the two, that is our Hamming distance. So that's why we call a Hamming distance. They physically, in this representation, look like they're, they are apart. Now, um, what we're concerned about is, suppose we transmit um, over uh, uh, the, either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, but the receiver picks up 0, 0, 1, or 0, 1, 0, or 1, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 0, or 1, 0, 1, or 0, 1, 1. Um, we know that we don't have any other code words other than 000 and 111. Who did it get mapped to? And well, the answer is uh, intuitively we would map to the code word that has the least amount of difference between uh, what we receive and what we can actually decode, like the actual code word. And so that's where the decoding sphere comes in. Notice how I sort of arrange these possible candidates for being received at the receiver. Um, where they only differ by one bit in this case uh, and get mapped to 0, 0, 0. So we create something called a decoding sphere. So that's our decoding sphere for 0. And this guy here is our decoding sphere for 1. And in this case, how much does 110 differ from 111? One bit, which is uh, way fewer bits differing than comparing 111 to 000, right? Uh, sorry, 110 to 000, which differ by two bits. So obviously 110 is closer to 111. And we do that for all possible um, uh, uh, re received code words, uh, whether, or whether, whether or not uh, they're actually part of co the code book and then we map them to whatever allowable code words are in the code book. And so through this process of decoding spheres, Hamming distances, um, and, and in this case we have a repetition code, we're able to sort of 
undo any sort of corruption when we have these bits that are flipped during transmission that could potentially cause error at the receiver. So now that we've seen decoding spheres, Hamming distances, uh, source encoding, channel encoding, let's, let's do a quick channel encoding example, okay? So uh, first of all, uh, let's suppose we have a rate one-third repetition code. So this is one type of channel coding with no source encoding, okay? So uh, it is possible um, for a communication system. So ju let, just to bring up the point, it is possible to have a communication system that doesn't do any source encoding and does only channel encoding, or maybe even a digital communication system that does neither source encoding nor channel encoding. Okay, so so uh, it's a it's not n necessary, but it's always good to have these um, these blocks if if possible. So in this example, suppose we just get straight from the binary source we do channel encoding on that binary source. So we have ones and zeros streaming in. And repetition code is a very interesting type of uh, channel coding because what it does is it takes every bit and repeats it by, uh, by some sort of uh, a multiple of times. So when I talk about a rate of one-third repetition code, so coding rate, one-third, what does that mean? For every one bit coming in, um, we get three bits coming out. So in this case, for every bit that we get in, we repeat it three times, uh, two more times. And so what we get is instead of one zero zero one, we get one 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 zero 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 one one one. So how does the code book look like? Well, it's going to be very simple. So if we get a one, we have three ones at the output, and that's one code word. And if we have a zero, we get three zeros at the output. That's the second code word of that code book. So C, its code book, it's equal to the code word 000 and 111. So what is the Hamming distance? So remember, how many positions are different between uh, a pair of code words? And it turns out these two are totally different. They're off by a factor of three. Now, let's suppose I, I, I change things around a bit. And now, zero gets mapped. We're, we're no longer dealing with a repetition code. But let's suppose code word that represents one. So we still have a rate one-third code. Um, one is represented by one, one, one. And zero is represented by one, zero, one. What's the Hamming distance? It's one. And that's pretty, pretty bad. OK. So now, last but not least, um, for, for this part of the lecture, let's, let's quickly talk about something called Shannon, Shannon's Channel Coding Theorem. Okay? So Claude Shannon um, was a phenomenal individual who uh, essentially uh, contributed significantly to the information age. In fact, without Shannon, we wouldn't be here today in terms of all these conveniences of how information is just seamlessly shared amongst all of us uh, using wireless means, fiber optic, uh, wired, ethernet, you name it. Shannon was vital in, in terms of uh, enabling the information age to take off. And, there, and one of the, his primary contributions uh, to an area called information theory, which um, is not covered extensively in this course, is actually, uh, but there are other courses out there which do cover um, information theory and 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 uh, uh, concepts and such. But uh, to, let's just briefly go over his contribution with respect to deriving something called the Shannon capacity. So capacity. So suppose we have a channel. So this is the transmission medium. And let's say that transmission medium has a capacity C, okay? So, so what, what this means is, is that, you know, we have this um, sort of like limit, if you will, on how much information that we can transmit across this medium, okay? And suppose we have some sort of, uh, you know, we're, we're doing channel coding on this transmission and, and it has a fixed rate K over N, okay? And so this k over n is equal to some sort of constant. We call it RC, okay, coding rate. What happens is, suppose that n, uh, the, the size of the code words, increase. Then in order to keep uh, the, the, uh, this, this uh, code rate constant, we've also got to increase k as well in order to keep it constant, right? 
So what ends up happening is was Sh 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 Shannon uh, basically um, showed that there exists a code, okay? So he, he, uh, so he proposes that there exists a code out there. So he doesn't tell you how to build it, but he says there's a code out there such that for this constant code rate, RC is equal to K over N, okay? That if it is below the capacity C, okay? As we let N uh, basically go off to infinity, basically if the code words become infinitely long, what ends up happening is our probability of error should converge to zero, which is extremely desirable. On the other hand, uh, Shannon also uh, showed that um, if we have a code rate that exceeds this capacity C, that there is no code out there that exists that will give us um, um, a, a zero probability of error. Okay. So this C, this capacity limit, um, essentially is the limit in the rate, the coding rate, for reliable communications. So the C is our absolute limit that says you cannot go any faster um, in terms of your coding rate uh, without causing errors. Okay. So, you know, uh, the Shannon's capac uh, channel capacity is extremely important because this, to, to, uh, for, for everyone, essentially talk, uh, defines what the reliability is of our digital communication system. Okay. So what, what happens is, uh, fr from this uh, Shannon capacity, he, he actually came up with a, a cute little expression, which is uh, shown here in equation three. Um, so C is equal to B log base two, one plus SNR. And what's SNR? Signal to noise ratio. So the amount of signal energy uh, versus the amount of noise energy present in the channel, okay, its ratio plus one, and you take log base two of that, and multiplied by the transmission bandwidth gives you this limit. So remember, if you have a code rate that is less than C, it is possible to design a code that allows you to have zero error. On the other hand, if you have a, a coding rate that exceeds this limit, no hope, folks. Basically, you will, be, you, you will not be able to get a zero error situation. So what this, this information capacity tells us is the achievable rate, but un unfortunately, Shannon never told us um, how, to, uh, how to build a transceiver to actually get to reach this capacity limit. So this is important for the following reasons. Um, primarily what happens is, first of all, this gives us a sanity check, all right? So what happens is, um, when we, we when whenever we uh, let's say someone derives a new code a channel coding scheme and says hey I got this sort of performance and then and what happens is you compare it against the Shannon capacity limit and if it exceeds it and and you claim that you have zero error um, something's wrong uh, basically whatever sort of implementation you have there's something that's fishy it's almost like saying oh I'm traveling faster than the speed of light something is wrong and you've got to sort of ch uh, check your notes again. So what ends up happening is, um, th that's the first thing. So it provides us with um, 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 a sort of a sanity check. It also is a very useful um, as sort of a benchmark of comparing, let's say, one type of modulation scheme versus another uh, under noisy conditions. Um, as well as um, it, it allows us to do a performance analysis between bandwidth and SNR for a mo modulation scheme. We can see how it behaves in terms of the capacity limit. So, so given all that, um, Shannon capacity is extremely useful in terms of sort of establishing a limit that um, over the last several decades, people have been striving to create coding schemes, channel coding schemes that reach this limit. And it's almost like um, a race, if you will, uh, who can get as close as possible to Shannon's limit. And uh, at the same time, it also is used to sort of do the sanity check on people's systems to see that they're actually operational and, and don't possess any sort of errors. Okay, so before we end this lecture, let's, let's wrap things up with this concept called additive white, white Gaussian noise channel, which we talked a little bit about before. Okay, so what happens is um, in this course, we will be 
for the most part using AWGN channels uh, for most of the um, um, uh, work we'll be doing because it, it approximately characterizes and captures the behavior of what we see out there in the real world. And so just to reiterate, uh, white Gaussian noise has an autocorrelation function that is essentially equal to a delta. So what happens when we take the Fourier transform of a delta? We get a constant. We get a flat PSD, and we talked about this. What happens when you get a constant PSD, a constant, uh, um, um, uh, a, a constant across all spectrum? What that tells us is that it is white. It means it's uncorrelated. It's only correlated with itself at its own at at, at time instant uh, at time difference t equals zero. If we now use the concept of EWK and PSD from lecture six, we also know that, especially with EWK and that beautiful property of if we have a power spectral density being fed into an LTI system and it's filtered by it, the output will be equal to the magnitude squared of the frequency response of that LTI system times the power spectral density of the input signal. And so we know that the power spectral density of an AWGN channel the noise signal, right, is PSD is going to be flat spectrally. What happens if it goes through a filter? What happens is by EWK, we're going to have an uh, output of the noise that will be shaped by the frequency response. So let's look at the additive white Gaussian noise channel a little bit more, okay? So here's our AWGN channel. So we saw it before, we have S of T, we add N of T, that's our noise. So that's our transmitter here. The receiver picks up R of T, which is the corrupted the transmitted signal with the noise superimposed. And so we look at this and we say, okay, what are the statistical characteristics of the noise? And the answer is, okay, um, we, we could have a, a, the temp temporal, like if we say this is white, okay, and it's Gaussian and it's additive, right? What this tells me is that this guy here will have will be uncorrelated, which means that um, its auto correlation function is a delta. So R, sorry, R n of tau. So power spectral density wise, the power spectral density should be equal to a constant over all frequencies. So S n of f, it should be flat. And in fact, it will be equal to something called n naught over two in this case. So this is great. And when I talked about EWK, suppose now that that received signal R of T, and suppose R of T only contains, just for the sake of illustration, contains only N of T. So what's the power spectral density of that input signal R of T? It's essentially flat, right? N naught over two. And suppose that the receiver, so this is at the Rx, it goes through some sort of filtering operation, right? Some sort of pulse shaping filter, pulse shaping filter. And let's suppose that this guy is, uh, is represented by G of F, okay, uh, the pulse shape. What is the output of that pulse shaping filter? What, what's the power spectral density looking like? And so, so we use EWK, and we know that SY of F is going to be equal to the magnitude squared, oh, in this case, sorry, is going to be equal to G of F squared times SR of F. We suppose that this guy looks like a low-pass filter, right, with magnitude 1. That's G of F. What, what will happen is, what is this guy, what is, uh, what is S, Y of F going to look like? Essentially, what, what do we have here? So take the magnitude squared, it's still going to look like this rectangular wave, multiply it by S, R of F, which is this guy here. That's S, R of F. It is essentially going to truncate. It's only going to extract only the part that matches this region and throw away everything else. So the output the S Y of F is going to be equal to the shape of your pulse shaping filter, but it's going to have a height of N naught over two. And that's how you get S Y of F at the output at your receiver.